Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings from bygone books. Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings by Gary and Ruth from the classic books of Celtic lore and study. Chapter 6 of For the Religion of the Ancient Celts by J. A. McCulloch. Chapter 6 The Gods of the Brythons. Our knowledge of the gods of the Brythons, i.e., as far as Wales is concerned, is derived, apart from inscriptions, from the Mabinogion, which, though found in a 14th century manuscript, was composed much earlier, and contains elements from a remote past. Besides this, the triads, probably of 12th century origin, the Taliesin and other poems, although obscure and artificial, the work of many a confused bard drivelling, to cite the words of one of them, preserves echoes of the old mythology. Some of the gods may lurk behind the personages of Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Britonum, and of the Arthurian cycle, although here great caution is required. The divinities have become heroes and heroines, kings and princesses, and if some of the episodes are based on ancient myths, they are treated in a romantic spirit. Other episodes are mere Märchen formula, like the wreckage of some rich galleon, the debris of the old mythology has been used to construct a new fabric, and the old divinities have even less of the godlike traits of the personages of the Irish texts. Some of the personages bear similar names to the Irish divinities, and in some cases there is a certain similarity of incidents to those of the Irish tales. Are, then, the gods dimly revealed in Welsh literature as much goidelic as Brythonic? Analysing the incidents of the Mabinogion, Professor Anwill has shown that they have an entirely local character and are mainly associated with the districts of Dovid and Gwent, of Anglesey and of Gwynedd, of which Pryderi, Branwen and Gwydion are respectively the heroic characters. These are the districts where a strong goidelic element prevailed, whether the Goidels were the original inhabitants of Britain driven there by the Brythons, or tribes who had settled there from Ireland, or perhaps a mixture of both. In any case, they had been conquered by Brythons and had become Brythonic in speech from the 5th century onwards. On account of this Goidelic element, it has been claimed that the personages of the Mabinogion are purely Goidelic. But examination proves that only a few are directly parallel in name with Irish divinities, and while here there are fundamental likenesses, the incidents with Irish parallels may be due to mere superficial borrowings, to that interchange of Märchen and mythical Donne which has everywhere occurred. Many incidents have no Irish parallels, and most of the characters are entirely different in name from Irish divinities. Hence any theory which would account for the likenesses must also account for the differences, and must explain why, if the Mabinogion is due to Irish goidels, there should have been few or no borrowings in Welsh literature from the popular Cahoolin and Ossianic sagas. And why, at a time when Brythonic elements were uppermost, should care have been taken to preserve goidelic myths? If the tales emanated from a native Welsh goidels, the explanation might be that they, the kindred of the Irish goidels, must have had a certain community with them in divine names and myths, while others of their gods, more local in character, would differ in name. Or if they are Brythonic, the likenesses might be accounted for by an early community in myth and cult among the common ancestors of Brythons and goidels. But as the date of the composition of the Mabinogion is comparatively late, at a time when Brythons had overrun these Goidelic districts, more probably the tales contain a mingling of Goidelic, Irish or Welsh, and Brythonic divinities, though some of these may be survivals of the common Celtic heritage. Celtic divinities were mainly of a local, tribal character, hence some would be local Goidelic divinities, others class with these local Brythonic divinities. This would explain the absence of divinities and heroes of other local Brythonic groups, 
e.g. Arthur, from the Mamelogion. But with the growing importance of these, they attracted to their legend the folk of the Mabinogion and other tales. These are associated with Arthur in Killich, and the Dawn group mingles with that of Taliesin in the Taliesin poems. Hence, Welsh literature, as far as concerns the old religion, may be regarded as including both local Goidelic and Brythonic divinities, of whom the more purely Brythonic are Arthur, Gwyn, Taliesin, etc., They are regarded as kings and queens, or as fairies, or they have magical powers. They are mortal and die, and the place of their burial is pointed out, or existing tumuli are associated with them. All of this is parallel to the history of the Tuatha Dé and shows how the same process of degradation had been at work in Wales as in Ireland. The story of the Llyr group is told in the Mabinogion of Branwen and of Manuithan. They are associated with the Push group, and apparently opposed to that of Dawn. Bramwen is married to Matherluch, king of Ireland, but is ill-treated by him on account of the insults of the mischievous Evnissian. In spite of the fact that Bran had atoned for the insult by many gifts, including that of a cauldron of regeneration, now he crosses with an army to Ireland, where Evnissian throws Bramwen's child, to whom the kingdom is given, on the fire. A fight ensues. The dead Irish warriors are resuscitated in the cauldron, but Evnissian, at the cost of his life, destroys it. Bran is slain, and by his directions his head is cut off and carried first to Harlech, then to Gualis, where it will entertain its bearers for eighty years. At the end of that time, it is to be taken to London and buried. Bramwen, departing with the bearers, dies of a broken heart at Anglesey. And meanwhile, Caswachlin, son of Beli, seizes the kingdom. Two of the bearers of the head are Manoethan and Praderi, whose fortunes we follow in the Mabinogi of the former. Praderi gives his mother Rhiannon to Manoethan as his wife, along with some land which by magic art is made barren. Again, following different crafts, they are led by a boar to a strange castle, where Rhiannon and Praderi disappear along with the building. Manoethan, with Braderi's wife Kigva, is set out as shoemakers, but are forced to abandon this craft on account of the envy of the craftsmen. Finally, we learn how Manoethan overcame the enchanter Hluit, who, because of an insult offered by Braderi's father to his friend Gwaul, had made Rhiannon and Braderi disappear. They are now restored, and Hluit seeks no further revenge. The story of Branwen is similar to a tale of which there are variants in Teutonic and Scandinavian sagas, but resemblance is closer to the latter. Possibly a similar story with their respective divinities or heroes for its characters exists in among Celts, Teutons and Norsemen, but more likely it was borrowed from Norsemen who occupied both sides of the Irish Sea in the 9th and 10th century and then naturalised by furnishing it with Celtic characters. But into this framework many native elements were set, and we may therefore scrutinise the story for Celtic mythical elements utilised by its redactor, who probably did not strip its Celtic personages of their earlier divine attributes. In the two Mabinogi, these personages are Llyr, his sons Bran and Manoethan, his daughter Branwen, their half-brothers Nissian and Evnissian, son of Llyr's wife Penardim, daughter of Bailey, by a previous marriage with Euroswith. Llyr is the equivalent of the Irish Lair, the sea god, but two other Llyrs, probably duplicates of himself, are known to Welsh story, Llyr Marini and the Llyr, father of Cordelia, of the Chroniclers. He is constantly confused with Llyd Llawerint, i.e. both are described as one of three notable prisoners of Britain, and both are called fathers of Cordelia or Cridilad. Perhaps the two were once identical, for Mananorn is sometimes called the son of Ashloid, or Llyd, in Irish texts, as well as the son of Lear. But the confusion may be accidental, nor is it certain that Nodons or Llyd was a sea god. Llyd's prison was that of Euroswith, whose wife he may have abducted and hence suffered imprisonment. In the Black Book of Carmarthen, Bran is called the son of Euerith, or Ocean, according to Monsieur Loth's interpretation of the name, which would thus point to Clear's position as a sea god. 
But this is contested by Professor Rees, who makes Uwellet wife of Llyr, the name being in his view a form of the Welsh word for Ireland. In Geoffrey and the Chroniclers, Llyr becomes a king of Britain, whose history and that of his daughters was immortalised by Shakespeare. Geoffrey also refers to Llyr's burial in a vault built in honour of Janus. On this, Professor Rees builds a theory that Llyr was a form of the Celtic Dis with two faces, and a ruler of a world of darkness. But there is no evidence that the Celtic Dispete was lord of a gloomy underworld, and it is best to regard Llyr as a sea divinity. Manawethan is not godlike in these tales, in the sense in which the majestic Mananorn of Irish story is, though elsewhere we learn that deep was his counsel. Though not a magician, he baffles one of the great wizards of Welsh story, and he is also a master craftsman who instructs Pryderi in the arts of shoemaking, shield-making and saddlery. In this, he is akin to Mananorn, the teacher of Dermot. Incidents of his career are reflected in the triads, and his union with Rhiannon may point to an old myth in which they were from the first a divine pair, parents of Pryderi. This would give point to his deliverance of Pryderi and Rhiannon from the hostile magician. Rhiannon resembles the Irish Elysium goddesses, and Manawethan, like Mananorn, is lord of Elysium in a Taliesin poem. He's a craftsman and follows agriculture, perhaps a reminiscence of the old belief that fertility and culture come from the god's land. Manawethan, like other divinities, was drawn into the Arthurian cycle and is one of those who captured the famous boar, the Tur Truith. Bran, or Bendigaidvran, Bran the Blessed, probably an old pagan title which appropriately enough denotes one who'd figured later in Christian hagiology, is so huge that no house or ship can hold him. Hence he wades over to Ireland, and as he draws near is thought to be a mountain. This may be an archaic method of expressing his divinity, a gigantic non-natural man like some of the Tuatha Dei and Ossianic heroes. But Bran also appears as the Urdal Ben, or Noble Head, which makes time pass to its bearers like a dream, and when buried protects the land from invasion. Both as a giant squatting on a rock, and as a head, Bran is equated by Professor Rees with Kenunos, the squatting god, represented also as a head, and also with the Welsh Urian, whose attribute was a raven, supposed meaning of Bran's name. He further equates him with Uthor Ben, wonderful head, the superior bard, harper and piper of a Taliesin poem. Urian, Bran and Uthor are three forms of a god worshipped by bards, and a dark divinity whose wading over to Ireland signifies crossing to Hades, of which he, like Yama, who first crossed the rapid waters to the land of death, is the ruler. But Bran is not a dark god in the sense implied here. Kinunos is a god of a happy underworld. There is nothing dark or evil in him, or in Bran and his congeners. Professor Rees's dark divinities are sometimes, in his view, light gods but they cannot be both. The Celtic lords of the dead had no dark character, and as gods of fertility they were, so to speak, in league with the sun god, the slayer of Bran, according to Professor Rees's ingenious theory. And although to distracted Irish secretaries Ireland may be Hades, its introduction into this Mabinogi merely points to the interpretation of a mythico-historic connection between Wales and Ireland. Thus, if Bran is Kenunos, this is because he is lord of the underworld of fertility, the counterpart of which is the distant Elysium, to which Bran seems rather to belong. Thus, in presence of his head, time passes as a dream in feasting and joy. This is a true Elysian note, and the tabooed door of the story is also suggestive of the taboos of Elysium, which, when broken, rob men of happiness. As to the power of the head in protecting the land, this points to actual custom and belief regarding the relics of the dead and the power of divine images or sculptured heads. The god Bran has become a king and a lawgiver in the Mabinogion and the Triads, while Geoffrey of Monmouth describes how Bellinus and Brennus, in the Welsh version Belly and Bran, dispute the crown of Britain, are reconciled and finally conquer Gaul and Rome. The mythic Bran is confused with Brennus, leader of the Gauls against Rome in 390 BC, and Bellinus may be the god Bellinus, as well as Belli, father of Llyd and Caswallaun. But 
Bran also figures as a Christian missionary. He is described as a hostage at Rome for his son Caladolc, returning thence as preacher of Christianity to the Cymry. A legend arising out of a misunderstanding of his epithet Blessed and the confusing of his son with the historic Caractacus. Hence Bran's family is spoken of as one of the three saintly families of Prodine, and he is the ancestor of many saints. Branwen, white bosom, daughter of a sea god, may be a sea goddess, Venus of the Northern Sea, unless with Mr. Nuts we connect her with the cauldron described in her legend, symbol of an orgiastic cult and regard her as a goddess of fertility. But the connection is not clear in the story, though in some earlier myth the cauldron may have been her property. As Brangwain, she appears in romance, giving a love potion to Tristram, perhaps a reminiscence of her former functions as a goddess of love, or earlier, of fertility. In the Mabinogian she is buried in Anglesey at Innis Bronwen, where a cairn with bones discovered in 1813 was held to be the grave and remains of Branwen. The Children of Dawn, the equivalent of Danu, and probably like her a goddess of fertility, are Gwydion, Gilvethwi, and Maethon, Gvanon, and Arianrod, with her sons, Dylan and Shlo. These correspond, therefore, in part to the Tuatha though the only members of the group who bear names similar to the Irish gods are Gvanon, equals Gwydnu, and possibly Shlo, equals Lu. Gwydion, as a culture god, corresponds to Ogma. In the triads, Beli is called the father of Arianrod, and assuming this, Arianrod is identical with the daughter of Dawn. Professor Rees regards Bailey as husband of Dawn. But the identification is far from certain, and the theory built upon it that Bailey is one with the Irish Bile, and that both are lords of a dark underworld, has already been found precarious. In later belief, Dawn was associated with the stars, the constellation Cassiopeia being called her court. She is described as wise in a Taliesin poem. This group of divinities is met with mainly in the Mabinogi of Math, which turns upon Gilvethwi's illicit love of Math's footholder, Goywin. To assist him in his amour, Gwydion, by a magical trick, procures for Math from the court of Pederi certain swine sent him by Araun, king of Anuvan. In the battle which follows, when the trick is discovered, Gwydion slays Pederi by enchantment. Math now discovers that Gilvethwi has seduced Goywin and transforms him and Gwydion successively into deer, swine and wolves. Restored to human form, Gwydion proposes that Arianrod should be Math's footholder, but Math, by a magic test, discovers that she is not a virgin. She bears two sons, Dullan, fostered by Math, and another whom Gwydion nurtures, and for whom he afterwards by a trick obtains a name from Arianrod, who has sworn never to name him. The name is Hlo Hlau Guffes, Lion of the Shore Hand. By magic, Math and Gwydion form a wife for Hlo out of flowers. She is called Bladoiweth, and later at the instigation of a lover Gronu, she discovers how Hlo can be killed. Gronu attacks and wounds him, and he flies off as an eagle. Gwydion seeks for Hlo, discovers him, and retransforms him to human shape. Then he changes Blodoiweth into an owl and slays Gronu. Several independent tales have gone to the formation of this Mabinogi, but we are concerned here merely with the light it may throw on the divine characters who figure in it. Math, or Math Hen, the ancient, is probably an old divinity of Gwynedd, of which he is called Lord. He is king and magician, preeminent in wizardry, which he teaches to Gwydion, and in a triad he is called one of the great men of magic and metamorphosis of Britain. More important are his traits of goodness to the suffering, and justice with no trace of vengeance to the wrongdoer. Whether these are derived from his character as a god, or from the Celtic kingly ideal, it is impossible to say, though the former is by no means unlikely. Possibly his supreme magical powers make him the equivalent of the Irish god of Druidism, but this is uncertain since all gods were more or less dowered with these. Gwydion's magical powers are abundantly illustrated in the tale. At Pryderi's court he changes fungus into horses and dogs, and afterwards slays Pryderi by power of enchantments. He produces a fleet by magic before Arianrod's castle, 
With Math's help, he forms Blodoywith out of flowers. He gives Hlo his natural shape when he finds him as a wasted eagle on a tree, his flesh and the worms breeding in it dropping from him. He transforms the faithless Blodoywith into an owl. Some of these and other deeds are referred to in the Taliesin poems, while Taliesin describes himself as enchanted by Gwydion. In the triad, he is one of the three great astrologers of Brodine, and this emphasis laid on his powers of divination is significant when it is considered that his name may be derived from the root vet, giving words meaning saying or poetry, while cognate words are Irish faith, a prophet, or poet, German wut, rage, and the name of Odin. The name is suggestive of the ecstasy of imagination, producing prophetic and poetic utterance. In the Mabinogion he is a mighty bard, and in a poem he, under the name of Gwer, is imprisoned in the other world, and there becomes a bard, thus receiving inspiration from the god's land. He is the ideal foith, our Irish foith, a prophet or poet, diviner, prophet and poet, and thus the god of those professing these arts. Strabo describes how the Celtic Vartis, Foyth, was also a philosopher, but this character is given in a poem to Sion, probably Gwydion, whose artists are poets and magicians. But he is also a culture god, bringing swine to men from the god's land. For though Prideri is described as a mortal who has himself received the swine from Anuvan, Elysium, there is no doubt that he himself was a lord of Anuvan, and it was probably on account of Gwydion's theft from Anuvan that he, as Gwer, was imprisoned there, through the messenger of Puch and Prideri. A raid is here made directly on the god's land for the benefit of men, and it's unsuccessful, but in the Mabinogi a different version of the raid is told. Perhaps Gwydion also bought kine from Anuvan, since he is called one of the three herds of Britain, while he himself may once have been an animal god, and then an anthropomorphic deity associated with the animals. Thus, in the Mabinogi, when Gwydion flees with the swine, he rests each night at a place, one of the syllables of which is moch, swine, an etiological myth explaining why places which were once sites of the cult of a swine god, afterwards worshipped as Gwydion, were so called. Gwydion has also a tricky, fraudulent character in the Mabinogi, and although in his life there was counsel, yet he had a vicious muse. It also implied that he is the lover of his sister Arianrod and the father of Dullan and Slew. The mythic reflections of a time when such unions, perhaps only in royal houses, were permissible. Instances occur in Irish tales, and Arthur was also his sister's lover. In later belief, Gwydion was associated with the stars, and the Milky Way was called Caer Gwydion. Across it had chased the face of his Blodoywedd, Professor Rees equates him with Odin, and regards both as representing an older Celto-Teutonic hero, although many of the alleged similarities in their respective mythologies are not too obvious. Amathon the Good is described in Kiluch as the only husbandman who could till or dress a certain piece of land, though Kiluch will not be able to force him or to make him follow him. This, together with the name Amathon from Cumbric Ameth, labourer or ploughman, throw some light on his functions. He was a god associated with agriculture, either as one who made waste places fruitful, or possibly as an anthropomorphic corn divinity. But elsewhere, his taking a roebuck and a whelp, and in a triad, a lapwing from Aroun, king of Anuvan, led to the Battle of Godoy, in which he fought Aroun, aided by Gwydion, who vanquished one of Aroun's warriors, Bran, by discovering his name. Amathon, who brings useful animals from the god's land, plays the same part as Gwydion, bringer of the swine. The dog and deer are frequent representatives of the corn spirit, of which Amathon may have been an anthropomorphic form, or they, with the lapwing, may have been earlier worshipful animals, associated with Amathon as his symbols, while later myths told how he had procured them from Anuvan. The divine functions of Llauglauguffes are hardly apparent in the Mabinogi, the incident of Blodoywedd's unfaithfulness is simply that of the Märchen formula of the treacherous wife, who discovers the secret of her husband's life, and thus puts him at her lover's mercy. But since Hlo is not slain, but changes to eagle form, this unusual ending may mean that he was once a bird divinity, the eagle later becoming his symbol. 
Some myth must have been told of his death, or he was afterwards regarded as a mortal who died, for a poem mentions his tomb, and adds, He was a man who never gave justice to anyone. Dr. Skeen suggests that truth, not justice, is here meant, and finds in this a reference to closed disguises. Professor Rees, for reasons not held convincing to Monsieur Lot, holds that Chlo, lion, was a misapprehension for his true name Chlay, interpreted by him light. This meaning he also gives to Lug, equating Lug and Chlo, and regarding both as sun gods. He also equates Chlau Guffes, strong or steady hand, with Lug's epithet Lom Vada, long hand, suggesting that Guffes may have meant long, although it was Chlo's steadiness of hand in shooting which earned him the title. Again, Chlo's rapid growth need not make him the sun, for this was a privilege of many heroes who had no connection with the sun. Chlo's unfortunate matrimonial affairs are also regarded as a sun myth. Bladoiweth is a dawn goddess, dividing her love between sun god and the prince of darkness. Chlo, as the sun, is overcome by the latter, but is restored by the culture hero Gwydion, who slays the dark rival. The transformation of Bladoiweth into an owl means that the dawn has become the dusk. As we've all seen, all this is a Mersian formula with no mythical significance. Evidence of the precariousness of such an interpretation is furnished from the similar interpretation of the story of Kuroi's wife, Blonat, whose lover Kahulin slew Kuroi. Here a supposed sun god is the treacherous villain who kills a dark divinity, husband of a dawn goddess. If Hlo is a sun god, the equivalent of Lug, it's curious that it is never connected with the August festival in Wales, which corresponds to Lugnasa in Ireland. There may be some support to the theory which makes him a sun god in a triad, where he is one of the three Rithroauk, who cause a year's sterility wherever they set their feet, though in this Arthur excels them, for he causes seven years' sterility. Does this point to the scorching of vegetation by the summer sun? The mythologists have not made use of this incident. On the whole, the evidence for Hlo as a sun god is not convincing. The strongest reason for identifying him with Lug rests on the fact that both have uncles who are smiths and have similar names. Govanan and Gavida, Goibnu. Like a Mathon, Govanna, the artificer or smith, Gorf, smith, is mentioned in Kilich as one whose help must be gained to wait at the end of the furrows to cleanse the iron of the plough. Here he is brought into connection with the plough, but the myth to which the words refer is lost. A Taliasin poem associates him with math. I have been with artificers, with the old math and with Govanan, and refers to his kaya or castle. Alianrod, silver wheel, has a twofold character. She pretends to be a virgin and disclaims all knowledge of her son Hlo, yet... She is a mistress of Gwydion. In the triads she appears as one of the three blessed or white ladies of Britain. Perhaps these two aspects of her character may point to a divergence between religion and mythology, the cult of a virgin goddess of whom myth told discreditable things. More likely she was an old earth goddess, at once a virgin and a fruitful mother, like Artemis, the virgin goddess, yet neither chaste nor fair or like a Babylonian goddess, addressed at once as mother, wife, and maid. Alianrod, beauty famed beyond summer's dawn, is mentioned in a Taliesin poem, and she was later associated with the constellation Corona Borealis. Possibly her real name was forgotten, and that of Alianrod derived from a place name. Kea Alianrod associated with her. The interpretation which makes her a dawn goddess, mother of light, clay, and darkness, Dullan, is far from obvious. Dullan, after his baptism, rushed into the sea, the nature of which became his. No wave ever broke under him. He swam like a fish, and hence was called Dullan Ale Torn, or son of the wave. Govanan, his uncle, slew him, an incident interpreted as the defeat of darkness, which he hides away to lurk in the sea. Dullan, however, has no dark traits, and is described as a blonde. The waves lament his death, and as they dash against the shore, seek to avenge it. His grave is, 
where the waves make a sullen sound. But popular belief identifies him with the waves, and their noise as they press into the Conway is his dying groan. Not only is he Ale Torn, son of the wave, but also Ale Moor, son of the sea. He is thus a local sea god, and like Mananorn, identified with the waves, and yet separate from them, since they mourn his death. The Mabinogi gives us the debris of myths explaining how an anthropomorphic sea god was connected with the goddess Arianrod and slain by a god, Gavanan. Another Mabinogian group is that of Poich, Prince of David, his wife Rhiannon and their son Praderi. Poich agrees with Araun, king of Anuvan, Elysium, to reign over his kingdom for a year. At the end of that time he slays Araun's rival Havgan. Araun sends him gifts, and Poich is now known as Pen, or Head of Anuvan, a title showing that he was once a god, belonging to the god's land, later identified with the Christian Hades. Poich now agrees with Rhiannon, who appears mysteriously on a magic hillock, and whom he captures to rid her of an unwelcome suitor, Gwaul. He imprisons him in a magical bag, and Rhiannon weds Poich. The story thus resolves itself into the formula of the fairy bride, but it paves the way for the vengeance taken on Praderi and Rhiannon by Gwal's friend Sluit. Rhiannon has a son who is stolen as soon as he is born. She is accused of slaying him and is degraded, but Tirnon recovers the child from its superhuman robber and calls him Guri. As he grows up, Tirnon notices his resemblance to Puich and takes him to his court. Rhiannon is reinstated, and because she cries at her anguish, Praderi is gone. The boy is now called Praderi. Here again we have Märchen incidents, which also appear in the Finn saga. Though there is little that is mythological here, it is evident that Poich is a god, and Rhiannon a goddess, whose early importance, like that of other Celtic goddesses, appear from her name a corruption of Rigantona, Great Queen. Elsewhere we hear of her magic birds, whose song charmed Bran's companions for seven years, and of her marriage to Manoethan, an old myth in which Manoethan may have been Praderi's father, or possibly in some other myth Praderi may have been the child of Rigantona and Tirnon, which comes from Tigernos' king. We may postulate an old Rhiannon saga, fragments of which are to be found in the Mabinogi, and there may have been more than one goddess called Rigantona, later fused into one, but in the tales she is merely a queen of old romance. Praderi, as has been seen, was despoiled of his swine by Gwydion. They were the gift of Araun, but in the triads they seemed to have been brought from Anuvan by Poich, while Praderi acted as a swineherd. Both Poich and Praderi are thus connected with those myths which told of the bringing of domestic animals from the god's land. But since they are certainly gods, associated with the god's land, this is perhaps the result of misunderstanding. A poem speaks of the magic cauldron of Penanuvan, i.e. Puch, and this points to a myth explaining his connection with Anuvan in a different way from the account in the Mabinogi. The poem also tells how Gwea was imprisoned in Ker Zidi, which is Anuvan, through the messenger of Puch and Braderi. They are thus lords of Anuvan, whose swine Gwea, Gwydion, tries to steal. Elsewhere, Ker City is associated with Manoethan and Praderi, perhaps a reference to their connection as father and son. Thus, Praderi and Puich belong to the bright Elysium, and may once have been gods of fertility associated with the under-earth religion, which was by no means a world of darkness. Whatever be the meaning of the death of Praderi at the hands of Gwydion, it is connected with later references to his grave. A fourth group is that of Bailey and his sons, referred to in the Mabinogi of Bramwen, where one of them, Kaswashaun, usurps the throne, and thus makes Manoethan, like MacGregor, landless. In the dream of Maxon, the sons of Bailey are Hlid, Kaswashaun, Ninyao, and Hlevelis. Geoffrey calls Bailey Heli, and speaks of an earlier king, Bellinus, at enmity with his brother, Brennius. But, probably, Bailey or Heli, 
and Belinus are one and the same, and both represent the earlier god Belenos. Caswatlaun becomes Cassivalornus, opponent of Caesar, but in the Mabinogi he is hostile to the race of Clear, and this may be connected with whatever underlies Geoffrey's account of the hostility of Belinus and Brennius, which is Bran, son of Clear. Perhaps, like the enmity of the race of Dawn to Pateri, a reminiscence of the strife of rival tribes, or of Goidel and Brithon. As has been seen, the evidence for regarding Bailey as Dawn's consort, or the equivalent of Bile, is slender. Nor, if he is Belenos, the equivalent of Apollo, is he in any sense a dark god. He is regarded as a victorious champion, preserver of his honey isle, and the stability of his kingdom in a Taliesin poem, and in the Triads. The personality of Caswachlon is lost in that of the historic Casavalornus, but in reference to him in the Triads, with Caladauk and Gweowith, he bears the title War King, we may see a glimpse of his divine character, that of a god of war, invisibly leading on armies to battle, and as such embodied in great chiefs who bore his name. Ninyao appears in Geoffrey's pages as Nennius, who dies of wounds inflicted by Caesar, to the great grief of Casavalornus. The theory that Llidlau Erent, or Loden's Lamar Gentius, represents Noden's Lamengentius, Nuda, the change being the result of alliteration, has been contested, while if the Welsh Llid and Nith were identical, it is strange that they should have become distinct personalities. Gwyn, son of Nith, being the lover of Cridilad, daughter of Llith, unless in some earlier myth their love was that of brother and sister. Llith is also confused or is identical with Llir, just as the Irish Lair is with Alloyd. He is probably the son of Bailey, who in the tale of Llith and Llyvelis, by the advice of Llyvelis, rids his country of three plagues. These are First, the Coranians, who hear every whisper, whom he destroys by throwing over them water in which certain insects given him by Levelis have been bruised. The second is a shriek on May Eve which makes land and water barren and is caused by a dragon which attacks the dragon of the land. These Hlith captures and imprisons at Dinas Emrys, where they are afterwards caused trouble to Vortigern at the building of his castle. The third is that of a disappearance of a year's supply of food by a magician who lulls everyone to sleep and who is captured by Hlith. Though the Coranians appear in the triads as a hostile tribe, they may have been a supernatural folk, since their name is perhaps derived from Kor, meaning dwarf, and they are now regarded as mischievous fairies. They may thus be analogous to the Fomorians, and their story, like that of the dragon, and the magician who produces blight and loss of food, may be based on older myth or ritual embodying the belief in powers hostile to fertility, though it is not clear why those powers should be most active on May Day. But this may be a misunderstanding, and the dragons are overcome on May Eve. The references in the tale to Hlid's generosity and liberality in giving food may reflect his function as a god of growth, but like other Euhemerized gods, he is also called a mighty warrior, and is said to have rebuilt the walls of Caer Leith, London, his name still surviving in Ludgate Hill, where he was buried. This legend doubtless points to some ancient cult of Llyth at this spot. Nith, already discussed under his title Nodens, is less prominent than his son Gwyn, whose fight with Guthir we have explained as a mythic explanation of ritual combats for the increase of fertility. He also appears as a hunter and as a great warrior, the hope of armies, and thus he may have a god of fertility who became a god of war and the chase. But legend associated him with Anuvan and regarded him, like the Tuatha as king of fairyland. In the legend of St. Cotlin, the saint tells the two men whom he overhears speaking of Gwyn and the fairies that these are demons. Thou shalt receive a reproof from Gwyn, said one of them, and soon after Cochlin was summoned to meet the king of Anuvan on Glastonbury Tor. He climbed the hill with a flask of holy water and saw on its top a splendid castle with crowds of beautiful and youthful folk, while the air resounded with music. 
He was brought to Gwyn, who politely offered him food, but, I will not eat of the leaves of the tree, cried the saint, and when he was asked to admire the dresses of the crowd, all he would say was that the red signified burning, the blue coldness. Then he threw the holy water over them, and nothing was left but the bare hillside. Though Gwyn's court on Glastonbury is a local Celtic Elysium, which was actually located there, the story marks the hostility of the church to the cult of Gwyn, perhaps practised on hilltops, and this is further seen in the belief that he hunts souls of the wicked, and is connected with Anuvan in its later sense of hell. But a median view is found in Killach, where it is said of him that he restrains the demons of hell lest they should destroy the people of this world. In the triad, he is, like other gods, a great magician and astrologer. Another group, unknown to the Mabnogian, save that Taliesin is one of the bearers of Bran's head, is found in the book of Taliesin and in the late story of Taliesin. These, like the Arthur cycle, often refer to personages of the Mabinogion. Hence we gather that local groups of gods, originally distinct, were later mingled in story. The references in the poems reflecting this mingling. Late as is the Hannes Taliesin, or the story of Taliesin, and expressed as much of it is in a Mersian formula, it is based on old myths about Keridwen and Taliesin of which its compiler made use, following an old tradition already stereotyped in one of the poems in the Mersian formula of the transformation combat. But the mythical fragments are also mingled with traditions regarding the 6th century poet Taliesin. The older saga was also developed in the district south of the Dovey estuary. In Lake Tegid dwell Tegid Vol, Keridwen, and their children the fair maiden Krerui, Morvran, and the ugly Avagvi. To give Avagvi knowledge, his mother prepares a cauldron of inspiration from which three drops of inspiration will be produced. These fall on the finger of Gwion, whom she set to stir it. He put his finger in his mouth and thus acquired the inspiration. He fled, and Keridwen pursued, the rest of the story being accommodated to the transformation combat formula. Finally, Keridwen as a hen swallows Gwion as a grain of wheat, and bears him as a child whom she throws into the sea. Elfin, who rescues him, calls him Taliesin, and brings him up as a bard. The water world of Tegid is a submarine Elysium, with the customary cauldron of inspiration, regeneration and fertility, like the cauldron associated with the water world in the Mabinogion. Shall not my chair be defended from the cauldron of Keridwen? Runs a line in a Taliesin poem, while another speaks of her chair, which was probably in Elysium like that of Taliesin himself in Care City. Further references to her connection with poetry show that she may have been worshipped by bards, her cauldron being the source of their inspiration. Her anger at Gwion may point to some form of Celtic myth of the theft of elements of culture from the god's land but the cauldron was first of all associated with a fertility cult, and Keridwen must therefore once have been a goddess of fertility, who, like Bridget, was later worshipped by bards. She may also have been a corn goddess, since she is called a goddess of grain, and tradition associates the pig, a common embodiment of the corn spirit, with her. If the tradition is correct, this would be an instance like that of Demeter and the pig, of an animal embodiment of the corn spirit being connected with the later anthropomorphic corn goddess. Taliesin was probably an old god of poetic inspiration, confused with the 6th century poet of the same name, perhaps because this boastful poet identified himself, or was identified by other bards, with the gods. He speaks of his splendid chair, inspiration of fluent and urgent song, in Care City or Elysium, and speaking in the god's name or identifying himself with him, he describes his presence with Hleu, Bran, Gwydion, and others, as well as his creation and his enchantments before he became immortal. He was present with Arthur when a cauldron was stolen from a Nuvan, and basing his verses on the mythic transformations and rebirths of the gods, recounts in highly inflated language his own numerous forms and rebirths. His claims resemble those of the shaman, who has the entree of the spirit world and can transform himself at will. Taliesin's rebirth is connected with his acquiring of inspiration. These incidents appear separately in the story of Finn, 
who acquired his inspiration by an accident and was also said to have been reborn as Mongan. They are myths common to various branches of the Celtic people and applied in different combinations to outstanding gods or heroes. The Taliesin poems show that there may have been two gods or two mythic aspects of one god later combined together. He is the son of the goddess and dwells in the divine land, but he is also a culture hero, stealing from the divine land. Perhaps the myths reflect the encroachment of the cult of a god on that of a goddess, his worshippers regarding him as her son, her worshippers reflecting their hostility to a new god in the myth of her enmity to him. Finally, the legend of the rescue of Taliesin, the poet from the waves, became a myth of the divine outcast child rescued by Elfin, and proving himself a bard when normal infants are merely babbling. The occasional and obscure references to other members of this group throw little light on their functions, save that Morvran, sea crow, is described in Kilich as so ugly and terrible that no one would strike him at the Battle of Camelon. He may have been a war god, like the scald crow goddesses of Ireland, and he is also spoken of in the triads as an obstructor of slaughter or support of battle. Ingenuity and speculation have busied themselves with trying to prove that the personages of the Arthurian cycle are the old gods of the Brythons, and the incidences of these romances fragments of old mythology. While some of these personages, those already present in genuinely old Welsh tales and poems or in Geoffrey's history, are reminiscent of the old gods, the romantic presentment of them in the cycle itself is so largely imaginative that nothing certain can be gained from it for the understanding of the old mythology, much less the old religion. Incidents which are the common stock of real life, as well as of romance, are interpreted mythologically, and it's never quite obvious why the slaying of one hero by another should signify the conquest of a dark divinity by a solar hero, or why the capture of a heroine by one knight, when she's beloved of another, should make her a dawn goddess sharing her favours, now with a sun god, now with a dark divinity. Or even, granting the truth of this method, what light does it throw on Celtic religion? We may postulate a local Arthur saga fusing an old Brythonic god with the historic 6th century Arthur. From this, or from Geoffrey's handling of it, sprang the great romantic cycle. In the 9th century Nennius, Arthur is a historic war chief, possibly Count of Britain, but in the reference of his hunting of the Porcus Troid, the Torch Truith, the mythic Arthur momentarily appears. Geoffrey's Arthur differs from the later Arthur of Romance, and he may have partially rationalised the saga, which is either of recent formation or else local and obscure, since there is no reference to Arthur in the Mabinogion, a fact which shows that in the legends of Gwynedd and Dovith he had no place whatsoever, and also that Arthur the god or mythic hero was also purely local. In Geoffrey, Arthur is the fruit of Igena's Amor with Uther, to whom Merlin has given her husband's shape. Arthur conquers many hosts as well as giants, and his court is the resort of all valorous persons. But he's at last wounded by his wife's seducer, and carried to the Isle of Avalon to be cured of his wounds, and nothing more is ever heard of him. Some of these incidents occur also in the stories of Finn and Mongan, and those of the mysterious begetting of a wonder child and his final disappearance into fairyland are local forms of a tale common to all branches of the Celts. This was fitted to the history of a local god or hero, Arthur, giving rise to the local saga, to which was afterwards added events from the life of the historic Arthur. This complex saga must then have acquired a wider fame long before the romantic cycle took its place as is suggested by the purely Welsh tales of Kiluch and the dream of Ron Abwy, in the former of which the personages, gods of the Mabinogion, figure in Arthur's train, though he is far from being the Arthur of the Romances. Sporadic references to Arthur occur also in Welsh literature. To the earlier saga belong the Arthur who spoils Elysium of its cauldron in a Taliesin poem. In the triads there is a mingling of the historic, the saga, and the later romance Arthur, but probably as a result of the growing popularity of the saga Arthur, 
he is added to many triads as a more remarkable person than the three whom they describe. Arthurian place names over the Brythonic area are more probably the result of the popularity of the saga than that of the later Romantic cycle, a parallel instance being found in the extant of Ossianic place names over the Goidelic area as a result of the spread of the Finn saga. The character of the Romance Arthur, the flower of knighthood and a great warrior, and the blending of the historic war leader Arthur with the mythic Arthur suggests that the latter was the ideal hero of certain Brythonic groups, as Finn and Cahulin of certain Goidelic groups. He may have been the object of a cult, as these heroes perhaps were, or he may have been a god more and more idealised as a hero. If the earlier form of his name was Artor, a ploughman, but perhaps with a wider significance and having an equivalent in Arteus, a Gaulish god equated with Mercury, he may have been a god of agriculture who became a war god. But he was also regarded as a culture hero, stealing a cauldron and also swine from the god's land, the last incident you hemorrhized into the tale of an unsuccessful theft from March, the sons of Merchion, where... Like the other culture heroes, he is a bard. To his story was easily fitted that of the Wonder Child, who having finally disappeared into Elysium, later located at Glastonbury, would reappear one day, like Finn, as the saviour of his people. The local Arthur finally attained a fame far exceeding that of any Brythonic god or hero. Merlin, or Mervyn, appears in the romances as a great magician, who is finally overcome by the Lady of the Lake and is in Geoffrey, son of a mysterious invisible personage who visits a woman, and finally, taking human shape, begets Merlin. As a son who never had a father, he is chosen as the foundation sacrifice for Vortigern's tower by his magicians, but he confutes them and shows why the tower can never be built, namely because of the dragons in the pool beneath it. And then follow his prophecies regarding the dragons and the future of the country, and the story of his removal of the giant stance or Stonehenge from Ireland to its present site, an etiological myth explaining the origin of the great stone circle. His description of how the giants used the water with which they washed the stones for the cure of sickness and wounds probably points to some ritual for healing in connection with these megaliths. Finally, we hear of his transformation of the lovelorn Uther and his confidian Ulfin, as well as of himself. Here he appears as little more than an ideal magician, possibly an old god, like the Irish god of Druidism, to whose legend had been attached a story of supernatural conception. Professor Rees regards him as a Celtic Zeus, or as the sun, because late legends tell of his disappearance in a glass house into the sea. The glass house is the expanse of light travelling with the sun, Merlin, while the Lady of the Lake, who comes daily to solace Merlin in his enchanted prison, is a dawn goddess. Stonehenge was probably a temple of this Celtic Zeus, whose late legendary self we have in Merlin. Such late romantic episodes, and an etiological myth, can hardly be regarded as affording safe basis for these views, and their mythological interpretation is more than doubtful. A son is never prisoner of the dawn, as Merlin is of Vivian. Merlin and his glass house disappear forever, but the sun reappears every morning. Even the most poetic mythology must conform in some degree to actual phenomena, but this cannot be said of the systems of mythological interpretation. If Merlin belongs to the pagan period at all, he was probably an ideal magician or god of magicians, prominent perhaps in the Arthur saga, as in the later romances, and credited with a mysterious origin and an equally mysterious ending, the latter described in many different ways. The boastful Kai of the romances appears already in Kiluch, while in Geoffrey he is Arthur's seneschal. Nobler traits are his in later Welsh poetry. He's a mighty warrior, fighting even against a hundred, though his powers as a toper are also great. Here, too, his death is lamented. He may thus have been a god of war, and his battle fury may be poetically described in a curious passage referred to him in Kiluch. His breath lasted nine days and nine nights under water. He could remain without sleep for the same period. No physician could heal a wound inflicted by his sword. 
When he pleased, he could make himself as tall as the tallest tree in the wood, and when it rained hardest, whatever he carried remained dry above and below his hand to the distance of a hand breadth, so great was his natural heat. When it was coldest, he was as glowing fuel to his companions. This almost exactly resembles Gahulin's aspect in his battle fury. In a curious poem, Guinevere, Guinevere extols his prowess as a warrior above that of Arthur, and in Kiluch and elsewhere there is enmity between the two. This may point to Kai having been a god of tribes hostile to those of whom Arthur was a hero. Mabon, one of Arthur's heroes in Kiluch and the dream of Ranabwi, whose name from Mab, Map, means a youth, may be one of, with the god Maponos, equated with Apollo in Britain and Gaul, perhaps as a god of healing springs. His mother's name, Modron, is a local form of Matrona, a river goddess, and probably one of the mother goddesses, as her name implies. In the triads, Mabon is one of the three eminent prisoners of Prudine. To obtain his help in hunting the magic boar, his prison must be found, and this is done by animals, in accordance with the Mersian formula, while the words spoken by them show the immense duration of his imprisonment, perhaps a hint of his immortality. But he was also said to have died and been buried at Nantal, which, like Gloucester, the place of his prison, may have been a site of his widely extended cult. Taken as a whole, the various gods and heroes of the Brythons, so far as they are known to us, just as they resembled the Irish divinities in having been later regarded as mortals, magicians and fairies, so they resemble them in their functions, dimly as these are perceived. They are associated with Elysium. They are lords of fertility and growth, of the sea, of the arts of culture and of war. The prominent position of certain goddesses may point to what has already been discovered of them in Gaul and Ireland, their preeminence and independence. But like the divinities of Gaul and Ireland, those of Wales were merely local in character, and only in a few cases attained the wider popularity and cult. Certain British gods mentioned on inscriptions may be identified with some of those just considered. Nodons with Niz or Llith, Belenos with Belenus or Bailey, Maponus with Mabon, Taranos, in continental inscriptions only, with a Taran mentioned in Kiluch. Others are referred to in classical writings, Andrasta, a goddess of victory to whom Boudica prayed, Sul, a goddess of hot springs equated with Minerva at Bath. Inscriptions also mention Epona, the horse goddess, Brigantia, perhaps a form of Bridget, Belisama, the Mercury in Ptolemy, a goddess in Gaulish inscriptions. Others refer to the group goddesses, the Matres. Some gods are equated with Mars, Camulos, known also on the continent and perhaps the same as Kumal, father of Finn, Belatucadros, comely in slaughter, Cocidius, Coriaticus, Barex and Totatis, perhaps Lucan's Tutatis. Others are equated with Apollo in his character as a god of healing. Anextiomarus, Granos, at Musselberg and in many continental inscriptions, Arvalus, Mogons, etc. Most of these and many others found on isolated inscriptions were probably local in character, although some, occurring also on the continent, had attained a wider popularity. But some of the inscriptions referring to the latter may be due to Gaulish soldiers quartered in Britain. That was chapter six of The Religion of the Ancient Celts by J. A. McCulloch. A link to the full text can be found in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not try our sister podcast, The Celtic Myth Pod Show, which brings the stories of ancient Celts to life with narrative and drama, as well as bringing you modern Celtic music, stories, and information. Find The Celtic Myth Pod Show in all the places where the best podcasts hang out or on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. We'd like to say a massive thank you and give a shout out to Daniel, Selene, Erica, Kyle and Brandy for being patrons of the podcast on our Patreon page. Thank you so much. 
Your support is ensuring that we can keep on making these shows. If you'd like to support our continued work on Celtic Tomes, please come and find us on patreon.com forward slash Celtic Tomes. That's patreon.com forward slash Celtic Tomes. You've been listening to Celtic Tomes, read by Gary and Ruth. Our theme music is Gander in the Pretty Hole by Slauncher. And a link to their music can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com. This podcast has been produced by the Celtic Myth Show.